Welcome everybody to this week's Grower to Grower webinar featuring Jack Mannix of Walker Farm in Demerston. Jack has quite a number of greenhouses and tunnels and variety of greenhouse monitoring systems and he's going to talk about those today. I'm gonna to stop my share so you can pull your slides up, Jack. Okie dokie. Um, all righty, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the neighborhood down, down here in Southern Vermont. We don't get that many visitors. Everybody goes to the restaurants up north, but um, I don't know how it is up there, but this is an unusually warm start to our uh, spring. So, but we've had some cold, we've had some cold blasts. And from my experience, we'll, um, before the, before April is over. And um, we're talking about monitors today, we have, uh, Let's see, we have 25 structures. Five of those are um, tunnels, unheated tunnels out back. The other 20 have heaters in them. And I have uh, monitors uh, in, most of, in most of the greenhouses, um, only one in the tunnels out back. So I'm gonna uh, just go through some of the things we've used and um, some of the things that have worked well for us. And hopefully, uh, uh, you know, I always tell people if you're gonna, if you're even thinking of doing a greenhouse, first thing you should do is research a greenhouse monitor. You, you have so much money invested in the, in your structure um, and the crops inside, and we do a lot of custom grafting for growers. And it amazes me that each year I'll get a call. Oh, you know, the heater failed last night, or something happened, and we lost 500 plants at five bucks each. You know, and where you could put a, a simple monitor in for a, a you know couple hundred dollars for a wireless monitor, or even a less than a hundred dollars for a, a hardwired uh, monitor. So let me go through and show you some of the things that we've used. I, I really can't sleep if I don't have my um, greenhouse system monitoring system working. So I have to make sure that uh, it's online every night. And I can tell you this simple rule I have that the monitors only work when they're working. <laughs> so you can have them all in place, but if you don't test them out, uh, and there's a lot of things you know that can happen to those also. If you don't test them out, then you could have a problem. Years ago, we had a remote greenhouse about five miles away that we leased from a friend of mine. And so we used this Sensophone system. It was one of the earliest ones I can remember. For that, that's, that requires a phone line. It was kind of cool, you could, um, dial in and get the temperature reading and it also had this cool little feature where you could listen into the greenhouse for like 10 seconds so if somebody was there you could kind of freak them out and say hey what are you doing in there you know but uh it's uh it was it was it worked it was a good system but it did require a phone line uh, and i think I, i'm not sure there may be they may have them now with wireless or, or cellular but we then uh for our our greenhouses around here, I, I still have this system. It's from Thermalarm. They were out of Peterborough, New Hampshire. And this was the original unit that used to come with the Thermalarms. It, I don't think you can find it anymore. They stopped making it because there was not not a big demand for it for some reason or other, but we love it. It's in the, it's a unit, it's in the house. And um, it just plugs in and you, it, uh, we run a thermostat, a two strand thermostat wire goes uh, through a tube down to our main greenhouses and then branches out and daisy chains um, a lot of the a lot of the greenhouses to these thermal arms which I'll show you but it uh, what's nice about this is uh, it has a sound it does this intermittent beep when the power's off so you know that you've got an issue there um, and then it but it also does this incredible shrill noise that is actually woken up the dead in the cemetery up the road. It, it gets you out of bed really quickly to shut it off. Um, so, you know, we, it's, it's a great, it's a great alarm for that. You can disable that alarm, you know, um, if you need to temporarily, but I always leave it on and uh, what <laughs> my poor wife will have to wake up and she'll have a radio and then I'll go around to different greenhouses. Uh, or I used to have to go around to different greenhouses to identify where it was and then she'll tell me when it's off and then I can. Uh, Ed Person had a great system where he ran like a, a multi a multi line thermostat wire and each each line went to a, 
uh, specific greenhouse and he had a board with toggle switches on it. So he was able from in the house just to flip those toggle switches and then he could go right to the greenhouse. This is the thermal arm and it's, it's uh, I think 45, 50 bucks maybe now. Um, and you can set, you set it for, a, we usually set it around 45 to 50 degrees, depending on the greenhouse. I might set it at, for winter greens at 30 or something if I'm worried. But on the, on the bottom left sitting on that box is a little toggle switch so that um, like a day like today, we'll go around and uh, probably flip them off because the sun will probably get them. They'll, they're, they're not set up the way they probably should be. So the sun will heat them up. But that's another advantage of these because you can lose a crop really quickly, not just to the cold, but to the heat. I mean, you may be downtown or you may be uh, doing something and in, in, especially in March and it's been cold and all of a sudden the sun comes out and your greenhouses are locked up tight and you, know, you can fry plants pretty, pretty quickly. So it is nice to, to have uh, these guys. What I used to be able to do with the heaters that we had when the thermal alarm went off, I would go around and just go by the outside of the greenhouse, put my hand on the galvanized exhaust pipes, and then I could feel if they were warm, and I knew that, you know, that house was okay. But uh, now we use these high efficiency heaters that are uh, use PVC for a vent, and you really can't, really can't do that anymore because it doesn't send much heat out. So um, that's why we like, the, we moved on to this wireless system. I just threw this slide in here because um, this is uh, something I saw in a big commercial greenhouse, this simple little, uh, it's like a little pouch. I got it off of eBay and uh, it's used to teach kids about the days of the week and the weather. And they had it there in, in their greenhouse. And hopefully you get, because we all employ a lot of millennials and, gen, and generation Z, and they don't know what the weather's gonna be tomorrow. It's sha la 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 live for today, you know? So they they come in and they, you know, should we water today? Should we water heavy? You all, you can look at this chart, for example, and see, you know, you're coming in on the sixth and you see it's going to be sunny for, you know, quite a few days. So we need to, you know, give a good watering today. If you had, you know, three days of rainy, whether you might water a little, uh, a little more uh, lightly, but it, it gets, it's just, uh, since they don't look at the weather forecast, I try to get it for them, but that, that'll help eliminate problems that we have um, sometimes with, the, even with the, uh, with monitoring because there's a lot of different types of monitors, um, which I'll show you when we get to the wireless. And I see Robert Ar Arnold's on here. He can probably tell you a lot of different ones that I, I don't know about either. So this uh, this is just, uh, if you see this little, um, it's called an aspirator, it's hanging over. We have a heated bench and uh, this was a few weeks ago and a heated bench and um, this aspirator, uh, that little sort of tan box there, it hangs down and it has a fan in it and a circuit board. And so that is the really best way to get the true uh, temperature reading in your greenhouse because it's, it's passing the air through uh, the circuit board and it, um, it's not affected really by bright sun or, or the shade. You know, it's, it's getting you the, uh, the HAFs, the horizontal airflow fans are moving the air around. It's giving you exact reading of what the greenhouse is like. Above that is this little beehive thing. This comes from Texas Instruments. And we use that, we put our wireless monitors inside that. And that uh, is really nice because you, uh, it, it keeps, it keeps the, you know, the, the hot sun and also, you know, the, stray watering wand from um, getting into your wireless monitor. We'll go, I'll, show, I'll have better pictures of that later, but um, four of our greenhouses are computer controlled and have um, energy curtains. And so this uh, Asperger sends um, in data back to um, the control board and it has a photovoltaic um, cell in it that um, can switch to it controls from uh, night to day and day to night. And it also uh, has humidity controls. And it also will tie in, we have a, a weather station that uh, comes with the Wadsworth systems and that uh, it will feed data into there and receive data. And I'll show you when we get to the control panel for that. This is um, a Harnois um, gutter connect that we, we set up for um, vegetable production. And um, down on the, well, sort of in the middle, there's like a bigger beehive. Uh, Harnois uses a little different system for monitoring. I'm not a big fan of it. So I have, 
uh, my systems in there also. So I'm really appreciative of uh, Dan Hartman and the lean farm, but sometimes I like to think of ourselves as the fat farm when it comes to monitoring. I think um, redundancy in systems is kind of critical because <laughs> I tell you, anything can go wrong. Certainly, uh, if it can go wrong, it'll go wrong with me. <laughs> so I have uh, uh, some of the most unique uh, instances of um, a system failure, but luckily there was a backup system in place for that. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little more. This is our Arnois system. Uh, it's an iGro unit that they use and it, uh, you can control just about anything you want in your greenhouse with this um, diff and uh, power venting, humidity controls. Uh, we use this uh, greenhouse, well this year we're actually using half this greenhouse for bedding plant, organic bedding plant production because the demand has been so great that uh, we needed that extra room. It's economically much more feasible than putting in an early crop of bee greens or spinach in that. We, we're still using the other half for uh, greens, but uh, we'll go in uh, after the bedding plants and greens with uh, BHNs, and then we'll follow that up in the, in the fall with a uh, winter greens production for our winter, deep winter CSAs. So this is uh, greenhouse is sort of the, at the outer reach of our, our uh, greenhouse area. And um, we use this extended wireless control from Monit, as you see, hanging from the top. And a lot of a lot of wireless is if you have wireless on your in your systems, you probably don't like to go through greenhouses. But this uh, extra powerful one has a great range, uh, and you can get it with a different with leads on it for the antenna. So <laughs> we have. Uh, what we'll do is uh, on the antenna, will um, the wireless antenna will get like maybe their their six foot or their twelve foot lead, and for example, we'll drill a hole in our four, we have a forty foot container with a cool bot in it, and we'll drill a hole and we'll put the the sen sensing unit in there, and then we'll run the the antenna wire through a hole so it can be picked up more easily by our wireless system. Uh, where it might not pass through the container as well. So that's a great system. Also, I put then I showed a picture of the we use these DRAM thermostats. They're accurate to uh, plus or minus one degree. We had a done by um, John Bartok, who's like the the guru of energy and of a greenhouse and uh, structural uh, efficiency. And he he recommended this type of thermostat that. If you, you know, if you use it for, it'll pay for itself in a year. And they're just, they're like $45, $50. And we were using hard, hardwired Dayton thermostats before that, which were accurate to plus or minus five degrees. And so these uh, will keep a much more even, even temperature in the greenhouse and um, very simple to operate. Uh, this just, we've switched over mostly to these um, High efficiency heaters, and that's the that's the duct work for them. You can see just PVC pipe because they're so efficient, ninety three percent efficient. They're they're sending most of the uh, using most of the heat in the greenhouse, and not sending 10, 15 percent of it out to galvanized pipe. You know, you put your hand on galvanized pipe when that heater is going outside the greenhouse. It always uh, made me made me kind of angry that uh, that pipe was that hot outside the greenhouse. Um, this is our, our uh, gutter connect, um, this uh, for ornamentals. And this has, uh, as you can see, an aspirated sort of uh, a little to the right of center uh, down below. And this, uh, this is the greenhouse we put in. We have four energy curtains. This one we retrofitted. We didn't put in when we built the greenhouse because we didn't have enough money. <laughs> uh, if I was smart, I would have borrowed to do it because it's a lot, lot cheaper to put in an energy curtain I went under while you're constructing the unit then to try to retrofit it move all benches and everything out and then and try to put an energy curtain and energy curtains and they're they're not just for saving um heat although they they supposedly save 40 percent of your uh, of your heating bill but they also are great for cooling and when they're con computer controlled I, when i f first got my first one i I was checking the greenhouses one snowy night and I came down and I saw that the energy curtain was uh, 
open about a third. And I was like, oh, nuts, that sucker didn't close. And then I realized that what had happened is that the weather station told the computer that it, there was precipitation and that it was below 32 degrees. So it opened up the energy curtain one third to allow heat to go up to melt the snow on the roof. And then when the precipitation stopped, the energy curtain closed up again. So another case of uh, the computer be, being smarter than, than I was. Um, and that's why, as you know, when we have so many greenhouses, the more technology that we can use to help us eliminate mistakes, um, the better. Uh, so with the Monet system, uh, we were lucky enough to have um, Michael Smith help us set up this uh, the Monet system when it first came out. It was a different company that it was Monet equipment through a different company, and it wasn't that friendly. The company you couldn't do a lot of the stuff yourself. But once we switched over to Monet, it's really nice. You can uh, do all the editing of the uh, each individual. We have a subscription that allows for 25 monitors and we use all those and in, in, <clears throat> they're not all temperature or humidity monitors, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, but they have a monitor for just about everything. And <clears throat> this again is, oh, I guess just a, the beehive with the monitor in it and a dram thermostat. So this is the monitor. It's like a $45, $50 unit. I, I think this, I think the red ones are just the temperature units. For our tomato houses and for our coolers, we have the blue ones, which are temperature and humidity, which will show up when you check, uh, when you check the actuals um, going on. And it's just uh, a simple little unit that's run by a coin cell. And um, we hang that in that little beehive that's sort of behind the hand there. And so it sucks it up into it a little bit and put it fairly close to the crop so we get an accurate reading. They, they don't fail unless you get them wet. Then you know, if you want to have a spare on hand, it's not a bad idea. Hey, Jack, a question came in about these, asking if you prefer the industrial or commercial monet and humidity factor. I don't know if that's alluding to what- To the, to the, to the well, these, these are fine for short range. Um, the, the more expensive ones that I had in the Harnois out back, this, this wouldn't pick up um, our wireless way out back there. So I, I went for the uh, bigger one. And, out, and our tunnels in the backfield, which is probably 1,000, 1,500 feet away, that the, I have an, another industrial there. And that you know, gives um, a really clear reading, too. So uh, I think if you can get away with these, they're only 50 bucks. The other ones are like, you know. I forget, but they're like 200 or something. So it's it's best to go with these. The, the other ones use, uh, I think it's like a AAA or a AAA battery, uh, while these use the coin cell. The coin cells, you know, are really cheap. I, I will tell you an instance where things can go wrong. That's why I like to have a, a thermal alarm, as, which is a hardwired, the hardwired system, as well as the wireless. This year, we had the, where the wind was blowing, we lost, uh, the wind chill was really low. It was, uh, I forget when it was, but it was back in early March, I guess. And um, the uh, houses, and I forgot actually to test. I, I like to test the furthest alarm, the thermal alarm because they're sort of daisy chain. So if the furthest one works, you know, the other ones are probably good in between. And I forgot to test it, but I thought, oh, well, I got my, my wireless alarm there. And the wireless alarm, it's nice. You get a subs uh, You pay a little money to set up a little bank account if you want to have a phone call, uh, a robo call. So you can get a robo call, a text message, or an email with this, and you can send it to multiple people. So I send it, of course, to my Kim up, and he just lives a little uh, quarter mile away. Uh, so he gets it if I'm not waking up or something happens. But in this particular instance, that night the coin cell died on this monitor. So luckily I had that backup uh, monitor, the thermal alarm, because that went off and I was able to go out there and the temperature was dropping rapidly um, because the wind chill was below zero. So we're able to save, save the greenhouse. Each year it seems like these monitors uh, save me once or twice from having a, you know, a catastrophic event. And what do you do, bring in a portable heater if the one you have just isn't working? This little portable, I have four of those little portable, um, 
sort of tube heaters, you know, that run <clears throat> on a propane tank without electricity. Uh, and they, uh, you can get those from Granger. They're, they're relatively inexpensive. They're 250,000 BTUs, so throw out a lot of heat. The only trouble is you gotta be a little careful if you've got a low greenhouse. You don't wanna go away and leave it full blast. You'll burn a hole through the top of your plastic. So you, you gotta monitor that, the heat that's coming off the top of that. But they will keep a greenhouse actually, you know, like a, 14 by 96, 21 by 96, even a 30 by 96, they'll keep it, you know, 50 degrees or so, you know, if you get that blasting um, pretty well, so. So is that the voice of experience? Have you melted? Yeah, yeah. well, I came in with a, one of our lower greenhouses many years ago, and I saw the, I, looked, I happened to look up and the plastic was waving, like it was just about to melt, you know, so I turned that sucker down quick, but, uh, you know, so you gotta be a little careful of that. So this is, this is the temperature monitor, and um, like I say, you could set this up. I also, I don't know if I mentioned, but uh, where we had the remote greenhouse and we had the Sensophone, we had the thermal arm also. We ran it to this guy's house that uh, we leased the greenhouse from, and he actually worked for me, so he didn't mind. But we hooked it to an electric doorbell. So you don't have to have that um, you know, unit that you can't find anymore. You can hook it to an uh, electric doorbell, and that's pretty easy to do, and like a buzzer and um, adjust the volume on that. And that will uh, that will wake you up too. So uh, I, I think redundancy, and like I say, redundancy in systems, when you have thousands of dollars of crop or plants in a house is, is kind of crucial. We have two houses we overwinter. So uh, we really wanna make sure that those are protected. Oops, shoot, now I gotta figure out how to go backwards. Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> this is, uh, the phone app that comes with uh, the the uh, the monit uh, monitoring system, and <clears throat> this is um, I took a screenshot of this a, f a number of weeks ago, but it it, it sort of uh, will show you a bunch of the different things we have. Like the I have the twenty I have twenty five uh, monitors on this system, and you just scroll through them and you refresh them. You set when you edit your your. Um, temperature monitors, you can, I, I edit mine, even though it'll go through the batteries a little quicker. And the batteries usually, for me, will last about a year, of the, the coin cells. And then I um, re, redo them each spring. But uh, you can set it for the number of heartbeats that you want. I like to have my monitoring systems report in every 10 minutes, because 10 minutes is a long time when the temperature is um, you know, 10 degrees. So you want that uh, alarm to be fairly responsive. I know they come, they're set like at 120 minutes. And so you need to go in and edit that. But that will, like I say, use your battery up a little sooner, but that's, the batteries are, you know, 50 cents or something. So on the top, uh, I have this, and I'm actually gonna get rid of this. It's a local alert. It's, it's a third of a third backup system. Uh, Monit has a alert system that you can, a wireless system you can put in your house or you can put in a greenhouse and it will emit a, like a, um, a shrill sound uh, if there's a problem. So you could use that instead of a, a, a thermal alarm. But then again, it's also wireless. The power goes out, uh, you may have an issue. But I find that the alarm really isn't loud enough to, to wake the dead, which is pretty much what I need. <laughs> so uh, I'm probably gonna get rid of that and add just another monitor. So the next one, we only we, our greenhouses are numbered one to twelve, and then because we're superstitious, we had to start naming them. So uh, Mabel and Madeline, you can see we haven't we weren't using those greenhouses at the time, and those those temperatures are probably back from uh, the winter or the spring when the when their batteries died. So you're going to get that yellow reading uh, there, and even though on the far right it looks like the batteries may still be good, that's um, they are shot, so um, they need to be replaced. Um, the uh, Pegasus, which is <laughs> my wife's name for our uh, Connect or uh, Harnois, that you can see has a little different uh, bubbles there for uh, because it's using the long range monitor. So that sort of signifies that. And then um, there's an extended range in Pluto, which is um, 
either is a planet or isn't, but it's our furthest greenhouse out back. And uh, that gives us an idea, our furthest tunnel, I should say. And that gives us an idea of what the temperature would be for our crops in there. Um, what I really like <clears throat> that Monet came out with a couple of years ago is the propane tank monitor in the middle of the screen. And so that we have, um, let's see, we have 5,000 uh, gallon tanks. And so th this is hooked to, um, our main tanks that we use to, for the overwintering greenhouses. And so that gives me an idea of what the percentage is left in those propane tanks. And you can set alerts on that. So I get down to 20%, it'll send me an alert and I'll call my gas company. I'll actually call my driver because the gas companies don't respond, but my driver is awesome and he will uh, take care of me the next day. So uh, I, I really like that. I can be, you know, of course, I wasn't uh, anywhere other than Dumberston, Vermont, pretty much last year. But I can be, uh, you know, out of state or somewhere else, and and I can keep an eye on what the propane is like. And also, I've, you know, like anywhere there's a wireless or a, even I can pick it up in cellular down in Brattleboro. Um, I can I can look at my phone uh, when I'm waiting in line at Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> or something, and and I can see how things are going. Uh, now that the smart ranger is uh, like the third from the bottom on this this is um an extender so we put that in one of our furthest uh greenhouses and that's like a wireless extender that uh no from our our tunnels out back so that's kind of kind of a useful item just plugs in to um, an outlet has an antenna on it we do have um some more sophisticated um i sort of have an it guy that um uh, does things that I can't do. And he set up some wireless range extenders. So uh, for our garden center, we like to be able to use wireless to look up stuff and have customers have wireless at the furthest reaches of the garden center. So you can get wireless extenders also that way. Um, then there's our storage trailer, uh, which we keep track of. And that is way too warm for <laughs> what we what were using. I think everything was out of there by then. But um, that gives us an idea. We, we don't want our potatoes or onions to freeze in there. And we don't want them, of course, to get too warm also. So as you can see, and then as you look at the bottom one, you can see that on the right that that battery's filling. So when you see that red line like that, that's a good indicator that you want to change that coin cell. <clears throat> so it, all in all, this this what's nice about this is now my alarm goes off, my thermal alarm goes off. So I just open my phone app and I can see, oops, you know, we forgot to turn on the the heater or somebody because it was a cold morning turn the thermostat down to 40. we never unplug a heater we'll turn the thermostat down sometimes the exhaust fans will on a, some of our uh, ornamental greenhouses will suck in cold air and and set off the uh the thermostat so the heater comes on so they'll turn it down to 45 and forget to turn it back up or forget to tell me so i can go um look at this and i can go direct to that greenhouse and crank it up so all in all, the Monet system has really made a world of difference um, for me being able to sleep. Uh, this is a little, you know, <laughs> what happened? And you get a little carried away with technology, but <clears throat> the um, Nexus greenhouses we have uh, have um, what the, the Wadsworth and Viral Step controllers, and those are the units that <clears throat> will pick up. Yeah, you know, and we we don't use it anywhere near to what it's able to do for like some commercial grower that really, you know, has a huge range and knows what they're doing. But it does for us uh, what we need it to do, humidity. It also has a small, a local alarm in it that will go off, but you can only hear it really if you're in that greenhouse. But um, the heat, so you can see our thermal alarm is still in the middle. It's starting to fade after about 10, 12 years, they'll get a little yellow. You need to replace them. Um, but this Did is you the- Question came in about which monet sensors you use. Um, they're the, uh, let's see, saying here, three options, standard, hot, cold, I guess in the storage unit using a different sensor? Um, we, we, I use the extended one in, this, in the storage unit. You, we did use the regular one in the storage unit, and it, it, but it was a little bit erratic and getting picked up by our wireless network. So that's why I got the extended one with uh, an extra length on the antenna so that we could keep the unit in the greenhouse and 
put the antenna outside, I mean, in the container and put the antenna outside the container. So it was able to pick up. I would, you know, I would go with the cheaper ones um, to see if they work for you first. Uh, this sounds like it's more about the temperature range. But oh, the temp temperature sure. of the sensor. Oh, the temperature range. Right? Yeah, they all, they will just tell you what the, you know, I don't know how they go up, how high they go up to 120, I think, or something. So, you know, and they go down to um, like zero. So uh, it, it's quite a range on them. Um, you'd have to check the specs on the Monit, M-O-N-N-I-T website to get the exact gold. But for our range, which is generally like not below 30s and not above uh, 80, then they work fine for us in the greenhouse environment. Thanks. Sure. And this this Enviro step, as you can see, this has got a lot of screens on it. You scroll through, given us uh, the um, the reading for uh, right now what's going on in this in the greenhouse, and it keeps a running total of um, the light measurements, and it also. Uh, operates the curtain, the energy curtains are, unless you do them manually, <coughs> excuse me, are set to, uh, <clears throat> they're set to close a half hour before sunset and open a half hour after sunrise automatically, and then come on as needed uh, during the day. Like today, um, probably around one o'clock or so, or maybe before that, because it's supposed to be pretty warm. They'll start moving um, and helping, uh, even though we have top vents, they'll, they'll start moving and start uh, moderating the temperature somewhat in the greenhouse, but still allowing enough light to get through for growth. So it's not a big issue there. This is a little close up of the aspirator from uh, Wadsworth that I was talking about before and has a little uh, filter in it down that needs to be cleaned more often probably than we do, but this is just a little uh, fiber filter you can pull out, wash out, put back in there. And should I had a thought I had a picture. Uh, so yeah, here's the energy curtain and like on a warm day, it's, you know, it's like halfway open and it's uh, helping just to moderate the temperature a little bit. In our display greenhouse, um, we have a larger a, a 40 by 100 display greenhouse. This helps keep customers uh, more comfortable also on a hot day. And we don't use clear Lexan in that one. And that greenhouse on the roof, we use a uh, sort of a whitish Lexan that helps. It's not a real growing house, sort of maintaining house. Do you recall what the curtains cost? Well, it's, it's going to be different. They're going to cost, they're probably going to cost you around, I, I, I'm just making a guess here because I can't remember, but around 10,000 for, you know, a 40 by, um, or a 30 by, I don't know, that's a gutter connector, probably a 40 by 100, you know, it's gonna cost 10,000 plus installation probably, which is, I don't know, gonna be five or 6,000. It depends, like I say, if you're building it, it's a lot cheaper uh, in initial construction than the retrofit, but it's still, we did retrofit one, and it's still well worth it. Uh, it'll pay back is incredible. <clears throat> so if you, can, if you can get away with it, <clears throat> it's a good idea. This I put a picture in because we have these computer systems and after a lightning strike cost me about 2000 bucks, uh, went through the average surge protector we have. I had my uh, electric company put in these guys. These are really rugged surge protectors. <clears throat> and when you have a lot of electrical investment in a greenhouse, you may wanna think about having one of this type put in as a green light on it. If that green light goes out or if it turns red, you know you've been struck and needs to be replaced, but it's gonna cost you, you know, 175 to replace that, but it, it might've saved you, you know, thousands of dollars. <clears throat> and your system would be non-functional unless you had replacement circuit boards. So it's a, it's a really good investment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oops, and, oh, I guess that's it. Great, thanks, Jack. Wealth of info. <clears throat> Um, can open up for questions and I don't know if you want to keep screen sharing or not. People want to have you go back to something. Um, I see Gretchen raised your hand. So yeah, people can, this is a pretty small group. You can just unmute and talk or you can put something in the chat. Go ahead, Gretchen. 
Hi, uh, thanks so much for sharing this awesome presentation with lots of show and tell. Um, I appreciate you sharing some of the lessons learned and some of the paybacks as well on some of these. Um, I'm with Resource Innovation Institute and we are a nonprofit and very data-driven gathering research on basically the proving out of technologies like this to show if, if it's worth it for a, which scale of grower and what type of grower. So um, what would you say if you could go back in time and choose uh, which ones to invest in um, first and had the best bang for your buck. Um, you noted some ones that have really saved your butt. Um, and so I'm curious, which ones do you think you'd go to the desert island with? <laughs> well, the desert island, I wouldn't go to any desert island that didn't have wireless. I'll tell you now. <laughs> there you go, yeah. <laughs> Wi-Fi island. Yeah, but you know, you got to understand, going way back for me is a little different than going way back for you. Going way back. No wireless option. So um, we we went with what we could afford. And um, I'll tell you, we, we've learned mostly the hard way. Uh, I think when I first put my alarms in, I had like six greenhouses and I could I could afford thermal alarms for, for three of them. And I didn't put thermal alarm or have the time or the money really to, to put the thermal alarms in the in the back three. And so we have what we call, uh, we're referred to as Black Tuesday, when we ran out of propane in one of our tomato houses and that they got fried um, because I couldn't scrape up a hundred bucks to, to put in um, the thermal. I think if your house is right there, you know, if, you, if you're fairly close and you can, and thermostat wire is cheap, uh, you can just, if you can run that to your house, this is the most economical way to do it. And uh, is is sort of fail proof. The system that we have uh, doesn't require electricity. So if the power if the power now we have automatic generators, but then we didn't. If the power goes off, you know your your the thermal alarm system is still going to work. Um, the the wireless system will work through cellular, so that can pretty much be fail safe. But depends on the reception, I guess, in your area, and then if there's a huge power failure and your cell towers aren't working, then that's not good. But I would say that the thermal alarm for the price of the thermal alarm, 50 bucks, you know, 50 bucks or for, you know, I don't know, 500 foot roll thermostat wire. And then uh, another uh, few bucks for an electric uh, doorbell. That That is the best bet that you can do for, because that's all we could afford anyway. But if you do have the option to have wireless, then you can really expand your monitoring options. And I would recommend both because there, there's been times where they've both proven their value. And the Monet system is not that expensive. Uh, you do have to get a sub yearly subscription. You do have to buy the gateway to start with, and that's not that expensive. Uh, Robert Arnold probably could give you the prices better on those. But uh, you, know, you can set these things up very simply and edit them fairly simply. And it's just for the, for the security and the, the economic um, security and mental. Um, mental security. anguish. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really cheap. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it's a strategy that can be applied really at any scale. You know, I have a hobo meter in my indoor grow in my basement and am able to tell when things are going awry. Good, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Good. So we do have Robert on the call. And uh, I don't know if you want to add anything, Robert, maybe the next step up, if you um, are going to put in a wireless system, what do you see growers starting with? Because we do have a lot of growers that are just a few years in, just have a, a tunnel or two. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I, I'm on the road, so I wasn't sure if it worked. Uh, yeah, so just the, first to point out that a lot of the sensors that Jack went over, uh, which my parents have a bunch of those as well. Uh, we actually have the 50 sensor subscription because we have over 30. Uh, is what they call the Gen 1 or industrial sensors, uh, well, or commercial sensors from Monit. And I believe they are phasing those out support wise and also selling wise. So yes, they are a good value. Um, they are their first generation sensors and their next generation sensors are called ALTA, uh, A-L-T-A. Uh, and they, 
they improved and also took away some things. Namely, they took away the repeaters. They took away the local alert, which like Jack, we have and then found it really wasn't that useful. Uh, but they extended the range drastically uh, to the point where a single sensor can go like 1200 feet, no problem, even through multiple greenhouses and barn walls. Um, the price did go up about 20, 30 bucks per sensor. So when he was saying 55 for those small coin cells, it's more like 70 for the comparable uh, latest generation sensors. But uh, I found specifically that the the coin cells on those older generation, the first generation ones were just more reliable and in, in general than the newer Alta ones. I tend to recommend people move up to the in-between sensor, which is their double a model, um, which I, it didn't look like Jack had any of them, but they, they run on two double A's. So the batteries are still fairly inexpensive to run and maintain. And they hold up better to cold weather. The batteries last longer and the battery life is significantly better than the coin cell ones. Um, I generally only recommend coin cells for inside warm environments like houses or heated wash packs. Um, I mean, because I've put I put them side by side and we've had those coin cells from the first generation in our coolers and whatever, and they just seem to work. But the newer ones I've, I've had continual issues with in, in worse environments. So uh, I, I'd, I'd spend the extra 20 bucks to go to the next level, which I think they're about a hundred for the temp sensors that are the AA models. And then the industrial ones, of course, are great if you have worries of employees accidentally hand watering them and all those kinds of things. Uh, so that's, that's that. And the industrial ones are about 180. Uh, you will find that the, uh, I don't actually know the prices on Monet's webpage because they tend to sell them higher than MSRP on their own webpage. Um, if you buy them through resellers like myself, we tend to follow the MSRP uh, a little differently on some things. And I think maybe Jack can answer, but are those propane sensors the new Alta, or are they still on the, the same system that you had? So you didn't have to purchase a different gateway? No, I had to purchase a different gateway. You're correct. Yeah, I have two. Okay. Gateways. Yeah. Yeah. So you do, you already prepped for the new system, same as we are. Uh, half of ours yeah. are on the new and half on the old. And you'll probably notice those new ones go much longer range. Um, but they did do away with the repeater, which is kind of unfortunate um, because then you can't get like double the length, but you have to purchase another gateway. And from my understanding, Monet's gonna be coming out with a dual purpose gateway that can do both connect to your local internet and to your, uh, into cell, um, but that may be a year out. Uh, otherwise, when you purchase a gateway for a cellular, it's, you get what you get, you can't switch it over to plug into your own router. So that's just something to note when you go one way or the other. Um, the cell subscription is 10 bucks a month, so it's fairly inexpensive. Um, and these do run off their own wireless. I know, Jack went back and forth a little bit on Wi-Fi and with these sensors, and they're not the same thing. Uh, that's why these have such greater range. They use a lower frequency. Um, but, and these don't require Wi-Fi to work at all. Another misconception people have with a wireless sensor. So you can have zero internet and zero Wi-Fi in your farm, and you can use these. Uh, as far as higher end stuff, it's pretty much just the industrial sensors are, are better. They use uh, so Jack said they use triple A's. They actually use a very special commercial grade 3.6 volt lithium double A size battery that costs like five to 10 bucks, depending, depending where you buy them. But the battery life, which he's probably found is uh, years, even at 10 minute check-in times. Uh, we've had some that have gone three years with not even thinking about replacing the battery in them. And you can't actually use double A's with them. Uh, they have to be those specific batteries because of the voltage, but yeah. the range is good because they do have those extended antennas you can purchase and they hold up to dust and water and moisture pretty well. I do see some condensation issues though sometimes, but it's hard to tell what caused them to fail. If someone has a specific question, I'm, I'm happy to answer, but I think that kind of covered in some of the technical details that you did. And, and uh, the subscription costs start at just 40 bucks a year for one to six sensors. And then the one that Jack has, I think is a hundred bucks a year. And the one we have is 150 bucks a year. Thanks, Robert. Any other questions out there? You can speak up or type them in the chat. I, um, I just, just would say, Vern, that uh, on the propane, 
tank sensor, which we really like. It's very simple. It just fits, you know, your propane tank, the gauge on top is a, ba is a uh, magnet. And it just sits, uh, you, you have to, uh, you have to make, make sure, uh, I think on the monitor, uh, Robert may uh, know better, but on the monitor site, it'll, it'll have uh, pictures of the types of propane tank gauges that it'll work with it, but just sits on top pretty much. Picks yeah, yeah, Jack, Jack's absolutely right. Um, the cool thing is that those gauges, even if you don't have the right one, uh, you can just talk to your propane supplier and they will often just swap them out for free. Uh, they don't really usually require, unless you have some really old tank, uh, they don't require much other than unscrewing a couple of screws and slapping in the new one. And most will do it for free for you uh, to, to get you the one that fits for those. And those propane tank sensors are more expensive. I Yeah, they're wicked. They're $300 plus, maybe closer to 400 the, the, as I said, the MSRP is expensive on the website and those. So if, if you want something like that, you're, you're going to be saving a bunch of money if you purchase it through a reseller, probably, um, for those specifically. But we have two of them as well, and my dad loves them. You can, you can watch them, and we started piling more on tanks, and they go a lot quicker than you expect. So we're, we're pretty famous for the calling the company at the 1% mark. Um, <laughs> and these, have, these have helped us <laughs> avoid doing that. Um, this, is, this is Tim Taylor, by way of Janet. Um, I, a couple of things I wanted to add. Um, one, I wanted to give props to Robert for helping us with our Monet system. It's working very well now that we've moved out to the house. The Bell system worked extremely well for about 40 years. We did a man, manage to afford that extra therm alarm that Jack forgot to put in. Um, <laughs> however, the bell did ring in our bedroom, which was great, except if you're 100 feet away in the TV room, you couldn't always hear it. So that is a bit of a problem. Second of all, I would recommend that you do need to, it, it, it's might, we have probably 30 tanks out there maybe. And um, <clears throat> I do walk around still and check things like tanks, like Big Tom's tank now has a couple heaters off of it. So I just know to go look and, and have them come in twice a week to fill that one up. So there's still a lot to be said for walking around and checking things. Um, I know Jack has trouble doing that now. Some of us do too. I'm just teasing you, Jack, of course. <laughs> I remember Jack a few years ago being up here at our potluck just staring at his phone watching the temperatures rise and fall which is pretty amazing to me i've always been slower than jack to change to these things but one thing i wanted to mention above all is if the electricity fails and it's cold and you don't have a generator to get everything kicking um all of this is just not going to mean a darn thing so i would recommend thinking about investing in a generator if you don't have one already and uh that's, that's been crucial to us. And we noticed this year that our generator, which gets checked by contract twice a year, um, was putting out, um, was running and exercising, but it was not putting out voltage. So we've put in for a new Kohler generator. This one was about 10 years old and was a Generac. And we bought that back in April of a huge storm that took down you know, lots of trees and we were out of power for about four days. Anyhow, you can't get generators right now. They're almost impossible to, to find right now. Um, but I think that's a, a, you know, a, another very important thing. But I guess in summary, from my point of view, it's still, you can't, you can't, um, you know, come evening, you just walk around, you check your greenhouses. I'm sure you, you do that too all the time, Jack. But I think some of us think we can just rely on all this monitoring system and, um, and and you still can't, right? You agree with that, right? Oh yes, yeah. I I still am <laughs> able to hobble around. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, Me too. But, uh, yeah, I think the manual check. Is, uh, it's just that I've gotten a little smarter too, <laughs> and, and uh, with the wireless system, and you know, so yeah, like I'm I, I say redundancy in systems, uh, manual checks. 
as far as checking crops as as well as checking um, greenhouses you know the the recommendation is that you should walk through all your greenhouses at least twice a day which i don't know i ha i'm lucky I, i'm able to delegate that to some people <laughs> who are more capable than i am but yeah. uh, yes it's it's kind of key to be able you know you'll you'll go along and you'll find if i do a, a and i usually do a night walk uh, i'll find that a door blew open, maybe something happened, you know, um, it, it's usually something that I can find that I can just sort of adjust on a walkthrough. Yeah, me too. Any other thoughts on resiliency, I guess, you know, you've got the heavy duty ground, Jack, you're talking about generators, redundant monitoring systems. One thing about water source too, do you, back up for that or uh you know well, we, making sure your pumps well, are running yeah we're not on a city system um we do have uh three wells and a pond um and i have a five thousand gallon tank which is nice so we can we put a float system on that tank and we're able to uh run um jet pumps off of that tank so that each jet pump handles like two greenhouses and so we can we can have everybody watering at once rather than trying to you know tax up a, a system because the water down here isn't you know tremendous uh, as far as gallons per minute from a deep well. So I think having a sort of a buffer water area. Then if if you have a you know a well problem also, uh, it gives you a little leeway in time um, to get out and fix whatever the problem is. Yeah, we've had our we've had our pump go down and um, and 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 fortunately be at a time where you could get the pond to pump water up and put a spigot on and get hoses around. But that's a nightmare. You you don't want to have that happen, but that it can happen. One other thing I was going to mention: I have a lot of my friends who do their own um, maintenance on their on their Modines or their heaters, and uh, I would. Um, it's something that we don't do. We have uh, our local provider, Dead River, bring their mechanics in every year around March 1st and go through about 20 heaters and make sure we don't have them tear them all apart. We have them fire them up, look them over, and because you don't want them to tear them apart if they are blue. You don't want them to touch them then, but you want to have them look at it. When they do that, then if there's a problem, they'll come back and the labor at least will be free. That's how we've worked that out with them. And it costs several thousand dollars to have them come do that. But I, I see that as insurance. And the older I get, the more redundancy I want. I like two heaters in all the new houses. We're doing that. I like generators everywhere. <laughs> Everything you can possibly afford to protect your crop. Yeah, and on the note of... Uh of water, Monit also has a water pressure sensor. Um, it, it, it costs just as much as the propane sensor, actually a little cheaper, I think, like 330 maybe. Um, and we have two of those, one in our greenhouse system, because we have heated benches, and then one in our spring pump. Um, and I, I, more often than not, someone leaves the water on or something at some point during the summer, and that lets us know that the spring pump runs dry or something, the pressure drops or something is over pulled, and that gets used a lot those water pressure sensors so and I've had people put those on irrigation so they can make sure something doesn't over pressurize or under pressurize and it kind of gives you an idea if something fails at least 20 30 minutes or an hour earlier than you would have known by someone going and using it so it's a little of a heads up warning it doesn't it doesn't really prevent things from failure too much it more just lets you know a lot quicker that something went wrong and you're not gushing water somewhere someplace for too much longer than it could be um, and we've also this year putting in monitor relays on our irrigation electric irrigation pump so we can turn it on and off remotely because monitor has that ability um, and you could have it set that if you install the pressure gauge you could have it set to turn off if the pressure gets too much or too low um, as well it's all built into the same system but those those relays they can run up to 30 amp 220 and they cost like 260 bucks great just have a couple minutes left. Does anybody have a burning question that hasn't had a chance to ask? Um, this is Gretchen again. I'm curious, do you benchmark resource consumption or production um, against each other? 
to prove out the benefits of things like your thermal curtains on a production basis as well as on an energy basis? Oh, I, I, I don't really keep, you know, statistics on a spreadsheet or something like that, but I see my bills <laughs> and there you go. Yeah. That's a pretty good indicator. However, uh, you know, you would think, well, you must be saving a ton of money. Now you have a, like 16 of these high efficiency heaters, but we are also using those heaters a little bit more in the winter for, um, and some of the houses for CSA crops where I really like to have in a greens house if, if it's uh, feasible. Uh, just as a backup, you're going to get that night that's down to like 15 or something, you know, and yet all of a sudden your lettuce is going to be translucent. And, you know, if yeah. you get it at, thir at 30 degrees or something, you know, then, um, you know, it just makes a big difference. And so we may use a little more uh, propane in the, uh, in the winter than we than we used to uh, for those type of houses. But all, all you can see my, my gas consumption, I was at uh, you know a number of years ago with fewer greenhouses that were that 30,000 gallons of propane a year. And now I'm down around 25 with more greenhouses and more use of the heaters, so. Wow, that's, hey, Chris, a, great, that's you, a great benchmark, yeah. <laughs> Chris, do you have your hand up? Hey, yeah, morning. Uh, Jack, thanks so much for sharing so much today. Really appreciate it. Um, two, two quick questions. Are you seeing any additional benefit to having internet um, in more places? And are you doing anything for storage monitoring? Well, I, I just just have that. Um, I, we were talking about, I do have in our, our 40, um, is that the big container? Yeah, 40 foot container. We do have uh, the monitoring system uh, for temperature uh, control in there that will alert us if, uh, we have we have a just a very small electric heater in there to keep, um, and it's an insulated um, container, so it's uh, it's it's pretty fairly efficient. Now that small little heater will keep it above freezing all winter, um, pretty um, pretty much. So that's good. So yeah, we do have and the and the alarm is set at that, and that is both wireless and thermal alarm controlled. So that's good. Now on the internet, on the wireless. Uh, Maybe uh, Robert could clear that up for me. On the gateway, that the older gateway we have, it does require an Ethernet um, connection. You know, it, it's it's uh, we, so we we do run um, the uh, you know inter internet cable down through a you know conduit to to the, our main greenhouse. So uh, and then we have a um, a router and a wireless um, a wireless router down here. So yeah, it's it's. Uh, it's nice to have information. I have uh, Alexas and uh, Google assistants and a number of greenhouses, which um, it, it's beneficial to the employees to, to ask questions, uh, ask, they might look up a germination question or a variety question and they play music out of them, you know, so it's, it's the internet is just nice to have everywhere. Yeah, it, we, we have the same thing and I've helped a lot of people out that don't have cell because the Wi-Fi calling now on smartphones is actually, it's significantly improved from even just five years ago that you can use your phone with zero cell signal like it's actually on full cell signal if you have good internet. So it's very beneficial to people that, like in most places in the North Country and hollows and farms as you just don't get it. Um, also, you know, to actually probably more fully answer your question earlier, Vern, about what's the next step of sensors. And uh, I would say that that's actually installing uh, cameras in all your tunnels. So you can actually visually see what's going on uh, and hear what's going on in them from far away. And that's what we have in all of ours. You can hear if the, the, the heater's on, you can see that the, the fans are blowing, you can check and see if the sides actually went up and down like they were supposed to or a ridge fan failed or, or whatever it may be. Um, we also use it for tracking labor and seeing how long it took someone to do something later on. It's a bit of a record keeping tool for us mainly, but that is that next step in monitoring. And that's, yeah, you know, that all requires, of course, internet and hard wires tunnels, which you can do with wires as Jack has done, which is more reliable. And you can also do wireless point to point systems between buildings. That's fairly inexpensive. Well, great. Thanks for that. A little glimpse into uh, the future for a lot of farms. Jack, thank you so much. Everyone else that contributed. We're a little past 10, so we're going to wrap things up. 
this will be uh, posted on the website and join us next week, same time, same channel for a discussion of organic potting mixes with Holly Prusak and um, many of you, I hope. Take care, have a great day. Great, thanks so much for coming and uh, everybody have a great season. Take care. Thanks Jack. <laughs>